Hey guys, Connor from the Ticket Stub, and you are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate, or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com, or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Extension Hour. This is uh, one of our special, this is a special edition of the Extension Hour because we are working on 4-H. We're talking about 4-H. We're doing a series of three sessions here. We've got Michelle Mahalik and Justin Sines with us. You guys want to say hi? Hi, Michelle Mahalik. I'm a county extension agent for the 4-H program in Montgomery County. My name is Justin Sines. I'm the Urban Youth Development here in Montgomery. And like I said, we're doing this show a little different than we do our regular shows because we are um, working on um, sharing with people a little bit more about 4-H. So it's kind of like 4-H 101, 4-H basics, whatever you want to call it. Because people often have a lot of questions about 4-H. They'll call and we are more than happy to visit with anybody. But we thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity to just do a, a recording, do a radio show that's also recorded that people can go and look on look and listen on YouTube or the station's um, page so that the ooh, website and then that way um, it's it's just available at your leisure so whenever you're ready to learn more about 4-H. So in the first show we talked really very much about just how to sign up for 4-H. Quick recap. What it is, how to get into 4-H, what a 4-H club is. Um, we talked a little bit about projects and project for us just means subject matter, whether that's foods and nutrition or robotics or dog project. And those projects are typically a at least a six session learning program um, where they learn about a specific subject matter. Right. And then the second show, we got a little bit more into projects and a little bit more about the kind of contest and the way you can show off what you learn. Right. We got a little more into the meat and potatoes, if you would, of <laughs> 4-H. We talked a little bit about the projects. Talked about what we're really known um, known for almost is talking about the fair, because we get a lot of inquiries about joining 4-H during fair time. So we talked about fairs and some of the other state shows that we have, along with those opportunities for folks who don't um, do not have livestock. As we mentioned before, it's not all about... Uh, cows, plows, and sales. There's other opportunities for those folks who may not have a, um, an 1,800-pound uh, steer in their backyard. <laughs> who doesn't have an 1,800-pound steer yeah. in their backyard? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more about those, definitely um, go back and watch uh, the first or second show in the series. But this one is like, but wait, there's more. more. <laughs> because that is one of the things about 4-H. I mean, there's um, and we talked about it in the previous shows too. It's a little bit, it's kind of what you make of it, right? And if you want to um, like have a whole full fledged 4 H experience, in fact, we call it 4 H career, which, you know, I, I guess there's other organiz youth organizations. I don't know. Do kids have like a baseball career as a kid? Anyway, 4 H career is what we call it because there's a lot involved in it. So you can take that career as far as you want. So you get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. Um, and you'll learn as you mature that in theory, we don't, it didn't happen if you don't write it down. <laughs> so for the 4-H program, the way we collect that information, the way we write those experiences down is our 4-H record book. And it's an opportunity for you to record your project activities, but also the leadership that you're doing and your community service activities so that you have that information easily in your hand when you start having to fill out college applications and job applications and scholarship applications it's really hard we do an exercise when we do our record keeping training we do an exercise about how 
how long does it take for you to forget something? So we'll... <laughs> it we depends will, on the day. <laughs> it does depend on the day, and it depends on the significance of the mm-hmm. event. So we'll start off with when, you know, what did you have for supper last night? And we have lots of hands go up. Most everybody can remember what they had for supper last night. <laughs> Justin's <And> special. <laughs> I am. <laughs> And then we'll talk about, okay, today is Thursday. What did you do last Thursday? And mm. a few fewer hands go up. It's a little more difficult to remember, unless it was a big event, their birthday or a contest or a special football game or those kinds of things. And then we'll talk about, well, what did you do last month? And then what did you do last year on this day? And for the for the most part, unless you hit on their birthday or the an anniversary of a hurricane, they <laughs> don't remember what they did a month or a year ago. So we kind of come to the conclusion with that exercise that at least once a week, write down the things that you've been doing. And, and for the 4-H program, our record book has separate sections for your 4-H stuff and for your non-4-H stuff. So you need to record everything because you're going to need that information for all the organizations you're involved in once you start having to fill those applications out, whatever application that may be. And we've talked about some of the things that you learn in 4-H are really just life skills and record keeping is one of those things we have to keep records in life. So it's part of adulting. (laughs) Darn it. Your your boss is going to ask you to report on your accomplishments for a certain period of time. Your uh, government is going to ask for your income taxes. So at least once a year, you're going to have to figure out how to keep records or report on that experience as well. So this just the skill of record keeping and getting into that habit and that practice is an important skill you're going to need for a lifetime. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to look for things to put in those holes. So I realize it works a little bit backwards, but we've had several 4-H members who want to do a good job in their record book. They want to be competitive with their record book. They know they need to have community service projects in there. So then they begin to look for or create community service opportunities to participate in and so that they can put it in the record book. And what winds up happening invariably is they start doing those community service projects. They have a lot of fun. They get a lot out of it. Um, They have a good experience. And it goes back to being the right way, where they're doing the community service because they want to give back to the community and because they want to be involved in that, and then they have those things to put in their record book. So yes, it's a little bit backwards sometimes. Um, If you've got little ones, it's mom and dad having to look for those opportunities and help them get involved in it. But that's that learning process, and that's the part of expanding your comfort zone and trying new things um, that that we're really focused on. Right. And uh, so just kind of having a um, what you you mentioned, a purpose for doing that, having that little bit of motivation, uh, um, you know, I mean, hopefully – People just want to give back because they want to give back. But but if you've got that, I need to do it for my record book, um, then you start developing that habit. And like you said, then you just start doing it doing it because it's the right, best thing to do. It's a good thing to do. It's and, a fun thing yeah, to do. And, it's a neat thing to do. You enjoy doing it. Yeah. And writing it down and putting it in your record book is, is icing on the cake. Right. And then so we also offer, we help kids with community service ideas, too. So you did mention mom and dad sometimes are the ones who are um, kind of helping the kids come up with those ideas. But on a, um, a county, district, and statewide level, we also have community service activities that they can participate in. So in the 20-something clubs in the county, a, a large portion of them have a community service activity leader the volunteer leader who's taken on the responsibility of developing, creating, looking for, um, getting input from the members of the club as to what their interests are and what they want to do for a community service project. Um, And 
then to help supplement that our county 4-h council has one every month um, typically something you can participate in uh, without having to spend a lot of time most of those are collection opportunities um, and then our district has two and then our state 4-H has at least one community service project that you can help help with and count as a part of your community service activities. Right. And we'll focus some more on community service um, in a future in, in just a little bit uh, during the show. But let's go back just a little bit more to record books. So, you know, you mentioned what they are. So they're a record of the activities that a kid has done. How often do they do record books? Uh, you keep your records for a whole year and you compile all of that in your record book once a year and we have trainings in April and May to tell you how to all that information you put together over the year how to put it in that record book and then we submit those at the county level in June we have um, more volunteers that are experienced with that come and judge those record books give you some helpful hints if there's competition in a category, then they'll place those and the first place record books will advance to district and go through the same process and then the first place senior record books will go to state. Now those senior record books that go to state win a trip to Washington DC that typically happens in November. Um, and it's not a full paid trip but in Montgomery County, because of the fundraisers that we do, a lot of the funds, a, a lot of activities we will either help with or pay for. So we help supplement the cost of that trip. But you get a five-day five five day trip in Washington, D.C. for $1,500, and that includes plane tickets and meals and everything else. And then, like I said, we help you with the up the we help you with the cost of it right. and there's a lot of learning experiences while they're there so it's not just a you know go tour and s just see things but you're actually they're learning actually things doing there's, and yeah. learning things all right so um you want to do those because of the opportunity to win recognition is is good right right so kind of like our last show we're talking about the projects where we can kind of show off what you've learned and kind of exhibit it that's kind of where we have our record book uh, contest it allows those kids to kind of show off how well they kept records over the year all right then another thing that is it's very helpful for which you kind of alluded to <laughs> scholarships right so we're going to take a break we're going to come back in just a minute and we're going to talk more about the 4-h opportunity scholarship program and then other scholarships that are available that record books just kind of help make well easy. and all the other things that record book can help with all right, so stay tuned. We'll be back um, here on 4-H Basics 101. But wait, there's more. We've got so much more to tell you about. Um, but we're going to take a break. We'll be back soon. You're listening to the Extension Hour here on Lone Star Radio. We have the safest food supply in the world. Strict laws and regulations restrict the usage of hormones, antibiotics, and pesticides within our food supply. Production agriculture practices and technologies such as the use of GMOs, which is not any more or less risky than conventional crop production, has allowed American farmers to produce more food on less acres in environmentally sound ways. Find out more online at pathtoplate.tamu.edu. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make lives better. Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host, Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit IRLoneStar.com slash Conroe Culture. Welcome back to the Extension Hour, where we talk about our people, our programs, our partnerships, and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and a big, huge part of what we do in Extension is 4-H. So we've been doing a series of um, informational radio shows to tell people about everything um, that, you know, kind of the things that we tell people when we talk to people about how to join 4-H, what kinds of things that you can do, so it's all in this power-packed hour, uh, three hours is what it's going to be total once we get through to talk about um, our 4-H thing. So we talked about record books, right? Do Talking them. Talking about record books. <laughs> 
do them. Um, um, growing up as a county extension agent's kid, I did not know there was an option not to do one. <laughs> um, what was your experience with record books growing up? So my aunt was my um, club manager, and so I, I, I agree with you. There was, there was not an option. Um, I would go to her house, and we would sit down at the computer and get it done. And so, I, and I was not in 4-H as a youth, but had my children in 4-H, and so I still have some of my daughter's 4-H record books that she did when she was young. And it's, it's, it's cool to be able to go back and look at um, the pictures and the just the kinds of things that they did. And and we've had I've had conversations with um, Sierra as my daughter, and we've talked about you know the kinds of things that she learned in 4-H, and she can find those you know in a record book, which is is neat. It, of course, there are some mamas that are like really, really excited about those record books. I know Corey Hundle, our 4-H specialist, specialist, has told a story about how her mom <coughs> keeps her record book in a safe. In a safety deposit box. Uh, safety deposit box. It is important. Um, I do still have mine, and on occasion I'll go back and look and try to figure out how in the world I fit all of those things in. Knowing that I did all of them, mm -hmm. but not knowing how in the world I ever found the time or my parents ever found the time to with four of us to get all of that accomplished one way or the other and mm. um, our 4-H record books are yes it's an album you can get to go back and look at years down the road but more immediately it's it's a place where you have gathered all of those experiences like we said well ago to fill out applications but I've got uh, 4-Hers that have used it for their National Honor Society application, mm -hmm. um, for their, uh, I'm trying to think of that other organization off the top of my head and it's not gonna come to me today, it never does. The, the one most significant thing that I have seen it used for, is so we had a homeschool student several years ago, his main project was leadership and he applied to West Point and they were not going to consider him because in their opinion he was homeschool and didn't have any teamwork kinds of experiences that would have lent to you know getting into West Point. Mm -hmm. So he provided his state winning leadership record book um, for that opportunity and as a part of that application and that was the tipping point um, and he's completed you know, he graduated from West Point. So that's the most significant thing I've seen it used for, is a way to document all those experiences so that you have it when you need it. Right. Um, scholarship applications, um, if you look at the, what, 20 page Texas Public University application, there's yes. a spot on there for leadership experiences, there's a spot on there for community service, there's a place in there for you to talk about your extracurricular experiences. And our record book has all of those pieces in it. So all you have to do, you've got you know, four years of it in your book, or you've got the last six or eight years of records that mm -hmm. you can go back to and just copy and paste it into those application requirements. Definitely was helpful when I was applying for the Texas Common application. I think it's Texas Apply now, but that record book did come in handy when it came to that those sections. Yeah, and as we mentioned before, it's just kind of good good habits for mm. for future adulting. All right, so 4-H scholarships we've mentioned that a couple of times. So there is a significant amount of scholarships that can be obtained through 4-H, and the record book is a pathway to that. Texas 4-H. Foundation Opportunity Scholarship Program is a chance to fill out one application. It pretty closely fill up, follows your record book format. So that's once again an easy way to plug and play and put those things in there. And that puts you in the pot for what, 150 to 200 different scholarships, including 70 of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo scholarships. Um, and I think those are 20,000 now. 20, yes. Um, I, That's $20,000 that a kid can get <laughs> through 4-H. For their four years yes. in a university. <laughs> 
and it's it is work um, but if you're active in the 4-H program you're recording those activities then that increases your chances that you'll be competitive in that record book in that scholarship application system um, and for me it's not just that one I mean there's there's you know certain criteria you have to meet to be able to apply to that scholarship there's not any guarantees because from one year to the next you don't know who you're competing with you don't know who's graduating at the same time you are but regardless of that one particular system that record book provides you with the information to fill out dozens and dozens of scholarship applications you have it all in one place and I can tell you from experience I have judged been on a scholarship selection committee mm -hmm. it was not extension or 4-H related and I could not knowing any of the kids I could pick out in heartbeat which ones were 4-H and had done a 4-H record book because the difference in the way they presented their information, the details that they gave, the, you know, the numbers that they used for the amount of impact that they created, how many people they taught, how many hours they spent in community service compared to a student who didn't have that experience, didn't have that um, practice in writing those things out and the annual feedback that you get in your record book from the judges as to how to improve um, was night and day the kids that did not have that background the 4-h record book kind of background just their applications were terrifying I'll, I'll be honest <laughs> Um, they didn't have the practice in, in how to communicate in the written format. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the 4-H Opportunity Scholarship specifically, um, because you did mention competitiveness, and um, filling out a scholarship application is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work, right? It so, is. So um, just thinking in terms of competitiveness, if someone's just starting their 4-H career, some of the things that they need to think about in the future, but also when deciding if you want to apply for a 4-H Opportunity Scholarship, what are some things that they need to think about? You need to look at your activity level. The, the students who get those scholarships have been active not only at the club level and the county level, but They've done lots of things that show they're, they're expanding their horizons. They're trying new things all the time. They're doing new things. They're doing things at different. And growth for us doesn't mean that, you know, this year I had one rabbit and next year I've got two and the next year I have three. The growth for us is just growing your experiences, doing things at you know, moving from the county club level and doing things at the district level or the county level and then trying to do some things at the state level where that's State 4-H Roundup or State 4-H Congress or a contest at a major livestock show that you've gotten out of your comfort zone and you've tried new things. Okay, so and then um, how to apply. So what is someone like if you start thinking, sh should I apply for a 4-H scholarship? Are you in 4-H? <laughs> That's the first question. <laughs> Have you been active in 4-H? So um, the applications are typically going to be due in January or, or, or February, depending on the county office. I think ours are typically due in January is when we have it. the previous county. So we have time, lots yep. of time to help them. Yes. Um, they're going to be due in February, but it's always important that you fill out the FAFSA uh, in December. So if you're going to, if you intend, if your family's intending on applying, it's really important to get that FAFSA done uh, by December. Um, with that, we have our 4-H uh, online is our current system of where we manage our membership, and that's how we do all our entries for some of our district contests and state contests. And that's where we're going to have our record books going to get submitted through that online system. But as Michelle alluded to, we do have them turn it into us ahead of time so we can overlook it, kind of go through it, go through it with a fine tooth comb, so we can kind of give them, offer them some tips to how to improve that application so it's the best it can be when it goes to the judges. So once they get it submitted um, on our 
online system, then we have a committee uh, created of agents across the state. They'll they'll converge on the Texas A&M University campus, and they will go through those applications um, over a couple of days, I think three days, and they'll they'll go through their matrix and they'll select folks for an interview process. Uh, and then those those kiddos will have an interview in person at the call at the campus of Texas A&M University. And they'll have, I think, about three judges, and they'll ask them some questions. And then by, that usually takes place in May. And then by June, they'll find out which scholarships, if they were awarded one. Right. And those scholarships that are awarded are all the way from about $1,000 up to what we mentioned before, some of them as much the, as 20 000. The minimum right now is 3000 Okay. So any of the donors have to submit. The kids will get 3000 Um The donors may have... You know, they may pull some scholarships to get it to that point. Um, there's the interview process in May. Um, it, you're not guaranteed to get a scholarship if you interview. Um, and then we award all of those scholarships in June, like Justin said. We do it in time for them to enroll. Um, and part of the, um, the scholarship, uh, those folks who do get a scholarship, uh, during our state 4-H roundup in College Station, we have each night of our general uh, assembly is dedicated to highlighting those kiddos who got those scholarships. So they'll actually have a reception, usually with the uh, for with the larger donors such as the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, San Antonio, the um, Dick Walrath, Walrath um, scholarship, and then they'll be called on stage. So they'll be uh, announced in front of couple of thousand kids they'll get their name announced and they'll walk across the stage and get a picture with their scholar, their donor and their scholarship okay so in addition to the, the big ones the big ends <laughs> that, that you get Texas Forge there's also some in Montgomery County the our extension office has support programs so the extension education Association mm -hmm. the master gardener Association um, Montgomery County 4-h and Grounds Maintenance Conference, and a couple of others that are going to slip my mind right now, um, also give scholarships at the county level. And for the most part, like with the state scholarship, you have to be an active member for at least three years before you can apply. Um, where the state scholarship has minimums on the ACT and SAT, there's a minimum you have to meet as far as grade point average and class rank. Um, our county scholarships don't have those things. It's just a matter of, like the, the county 4-H program does require the record book, um, but grounds maintenance doesn't, you don't even have to be a 4-H member to apply for that one. Um, and the master gardener one is the same way. So, um, I think, and that's all one application for all of those scholarships. There's six or seven scholarships, six or seven organizations, and I think the last time I added it up, it's about a total of around $10,000 um, that we give out or try to give out every year through the county extension support fund scholarship program. Um, and once again, there's all kinds of scholarships out there. Uh, and that record book and, and being competitive with your record book, getting that annual feedback on how you compare to your peers, uh, improves your chances with those scholarship applications when, when it comes down to it, when it counts. Right. So record books, scholarships, but wait. There's more. We have more to talk about the kinds of additional opportunities that are available in 4-H. So maybe you're not ready to apply for a scholarship. Maybe you're just getting started in 4-H. We've got some more to talk about in terms of leadership opportunities, community service opportunities, and the other cool things that we think of um, as we have our conversation here about 4-H 101 basics, all of those great things that you can do in 4-H. And we're going to take another break. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Michelle Mahalik and Justin Sines our Montgomery County 4-H agents, and we will talk more about 4-H things. So stay tuned.
A Lone Star Community Radio is looking for those who are interested in hosting their own talk show with monthly and weekly slots available on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and on IRLoneStar.com. Start your own podcast, create your first YouTube channel, and be on TV. Contact Lone Star Community Radio online at IRLoneStar.com or call the station message line at 936 647 3776 to take your first step into the radio world. What can the Better Living for Texans program do for you? You can learn how to increase your consumption of fruits and vegetables, choose foods that are relatively inexpensive and good to eat, make your food dollars last longer, prepare quick, nutritious meals, help your children learn how to eat healthier snacks, and much more. Our program is committed to helping people like you improve your health through providing research-based nutrition education in a friendly, cost-free, and relaxed environment. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. Hey, y'all. It's DJ Mike from Dan Simon, Texas. Join me Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. as I count down the top 10 Texas Red Dirt songs that are packing the dance floor. I'll be featuring local artists and the story behind the hits, shows in the area, as well as new songs that make you want to dance. It's Dance Time in Texas with DJ Mike on Lone Star Community Radio, 104.5 KCZW and 106.1 KZCC, Conroe, Texas, or online, IRLoneStar.com. Welcome back. 4-H 101, all about 4-H basics. Here we are. We're having a conversation about 4-H, what you can do in 4-H. Um, now we're talking about the additional or other available opportunities. In the first show, we talked about just kind of the basics. How do you sign up? Where do you, where do you go to clubs? How do you find out about clubs? So very, very basic kind of stuff. And then the next show, we moved on a little bit, talked more about uh, projects that you can do, different um, project areas, finding finding your your finding your thing in 4-H, and then this one is, but wait, there's more because there's so much more that you can do in 4-H. You can, you can really have a very full career, a 4-H career, um, and that's for kids. So just to kind of go back and reiterate, uh, eight, three, no, third eight, grade, eight years and, old. <laughs> eight and in third grade by mm-hmm. September 1st. So if there was one that didn't turn eight until September 3rd, then they have to wait another year. Um, if there's one that's eight and going into the third grade, we recommend that they waited until after September 1st to get into the system because there's a whole lot of little things set up in the programming of that system to, to catch those things. Um, so eight and in the third grade up until the day you graduate or you're 19 on September 1st. Um, so it, they get a much broader, you get closer to 10 years now than yes. you used to. Yeah. And it sounds very ominous to get into the system. <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> it can sort of feel like, so there is a lot of, to 4-H like we mentioned. So that's kind of why we're, we're breaking it all down here. Our 4-H online system is the online enrollment system that we're referring to. And that's where it's official. You are a in the system yes. when you complete your enrollment in 4-H online. So in, in talking about the other opportunities, you know, we, if you're busy doing things in 4-H and you're active in 4-H, definitely you want to do a record book because that's a great way to just kind of capture um, for posterity all of the things that you're doing. But also we talked about Practice, the importance of record, record keeping mm, um, sure. and the opportunity To be able to use that book down the road, you're going to need that record-keeping skill, but you're also going to need a record of your extracurricular activities, your leadership, and your community service so that you have all of that information when you start having to fill out job applications, scholarship applications, college applications, um, and the skills that you learned while you were doing all of that. Um, To me, the record book is an opportunity to reflect on what did I really accomplish. You get so tied up in the day-to-day minutiae of what's going on, and from September to May, 
you don't realize how much you learned, how much you've grown, and how much you've expanded that comfort zone. Right. And then, as we mentioned, the record books help with uh, scholarship applications. And we actually have a 4-H member, a former 4-H member, who had a very full 4-H career and was able to pay for her entire college career with she scholarships. graduated from Texas A&M University with money in the bank because... She took the skill that she learned from record books and applying for scholarships, and she continued that activity level in college and the record-keeping process in college and continued to fill out scholarship applications all the way through. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't one big, huge, giant scholarship at the beginning that got her there. It was that continued effort through her college career Mm -hmm. that helped her come home with more money than she went to school with. And she is a very um, active, productive adult now, using her adulting skills. So Savannah (laughs) Martin, is uh, she works for the Dispute Resolution Center. And actually, we have a radio show that she was on where she talked a little bit about what she does with dispute resolution, and then she tied it back to 4-H. So if you're interested in seeing, you know, how how does 4-H pay off in things other than scholarships, just... You know, being a productive adult human being. (laughs) Savannah is a good example of that. And we have lots of those Mm, in Montgomery County. (laughs) Um, We have lots of them that have come back to the program. They're ag teachers and they're 4 H parents and county agents. um, Yes, (laughs) county agents uh, that are are still involved with the program. So, some again going back to those life skills. Every 4-H experience is going to have a little bit of leadership and probably a little bit of community service. So we want to focus now a little bit more on leadership. So that means having an office, right? Like you have to run for an office to be a leader. You have to have the title and then you're a leader. And I'm being sarcastic (laughs) in case you can't tell. Um, There's a lot more to leadership than just holding a title or having an an office. I'll let Let's Justin talk start on this one. So we always like to encourage leadership experiences with our 4-H'ers. And so I know some of our younger kids, when they first join 4-H, if they start in the third grade, they're typically not going to have an office title. We typically don't have a third grade officer. Um, but we like to kind of get their feet wet with at least some leadership experiment experiences that they can get at the club level. So some things that we might not think are leadership, but they actually are stuff like, you know, saying the 4-H pledge, standing in front of your peers and leading that. Maybe it's helping with the refreshments after the meeting, volunteering to, to hand those out to our club members. And those are going to be baby steps to get them used to being in front of folks. And then we hope that eventually as they continue in their career in that club, they're going to take a, a, a larger step and they're going to run for a an office and most clubs will have anywhere from six to eight six to ten club officers typically they're they're going to have a president vice president a secretary some of them will have treasurers they'll have historians um pub uh, publicity officers and most folks will start out getting a a little bit lower office, I guess we can call it. This is a, a beginning office. They won't, Most do not go straight to the top for president, but they're going to get some experience as maybe a secretary so they understand the process. And as you are on that office, you're going to learn um, how that club works and how the officer team kind of manages that club. As we had mentioned in the previous um, radio show, um, the kids are leading these entire meetings themselves. So it is that officer team that's going to be leading it. Right. They're coming up with ideas They're And and as you mentioned, too, they're just they're they're practicing. And I think in one of the other shows we talked about um, just the 4-H experience in general gives kids the opportunity to try these things out in a very safe environment. Um, So, you know, they might be nervous about standing up in front of a group like you mentioned, but they're they're, It's supportive. They're encouraged. And then they're able to, you know, this isn't so bad. And I think I'll do it again. And then we end up with like these district and state leaders. And then, you know, and as we mentioned before, like with Savannah, some of the things that they go on to do as adults are extremely impressive as well. Right. And as Michelle alluded to earlier, you know, we always like to push our comfort zone. So we we don't want to just have that club experience. And so one of the officer, one of the offices that we have within the club is what we call county council delegates. And so we have our club um, officers, and then we also have a county council. And that's going to be another set of kids who are going to have offices and meetings to kind of talk, um, 
that kind of give direction to our county program as far as our community services we kind of we talked about earlier um but we're going to have those those delegates that are going to come to our county council meeting they're going to give us um reports on what the club did and then they'll report back to their club and the idea there is that these kids will be actively participating in our county council meetings and then they'll actually can run for a county council officer and so we're taking an even bigger step and so we've got we've gone outside of our club now we're a county officer and as kind of been the theme of 4-H is you know we um we, we go county, district, and state, and again, we're going back to, you know, 4-H grows. We're going to grow true leaders, and so part of that is we have district officers that those kids can run for. And then the district officers sometimes can run for state office, they and we've had a few. They um, as part of where, wherever they're elected at the district level, they get on the state. The state has done a new... Uh, system for what they used to call delegate at large so there's six positions at the state level that are outside of that election position there it's a separate application and a separate interview um, to have the opportunity to be on the state level and in Montgomery County we have we have a couple a handful of clubs that are so large that it's likely that you may try to run for an office and you don't aren't able to get there just because the club is large and there's so many people that want to do that but leadership is not just standing in front of the club and filling that position um, even if you do the best job you can filling that position that's not the only leadership that's available to you um, as Justin mentioned you know taking care of or being a part of the refreshment committee um, and making the decisions as a group on that committee as to what refreshments you're going to have who's going to be responsible for it ahead of time um, volunteering to be bring the refreshments um, maybe you serve on one of the other committees in your club and you're not necessarily an officer but you're still gaining all of those kinds of skills at a committee level in having input into the community service projects that are selected or maybe it's the fundraising and you're helping decide when are we going to have a car wash and where are we going to do it um, and a part of that discussion um, you're going to be learning about your project through all of this process so another piece of leadership is once you get to a level where you've learned, you're going to turn around and share that information with newer members or younger members in the club. And, and maybe you're in sixth grade and you're teaching the fourth and fifth graders, um, or maybe you're in ninth grade and you're teaching the whole club about your project and what you're doing and sharing that information. Uh, so that's leadership also is whatever you can do to share the knowledge and skills you've gained and sometimes leadership is leading from the back seat um, you know whoever is in charge of that event you be the leader that's following them so that the other members of the club see that behavior and you're the role model in the club so you may just be a leader as a role model in the club and helping to lead those things yeah. excellent point there's way more to leadership than just having a title right but also um for our club officers you know they're going to get other experiences as far as campaigning so typically in our clubs and the county council we'll have elections and those are usually by ballot uh, that are going to be held in the fall but for district um, one of my favorite things is uh, officer elections and those are typically going to be for our, our senior folks, our senior kids who are going to be that 9th through 12th. It, um, we elect in June, so it's going to be our 8th graders going into ninth grade. So it's ninth through 12th grade. And so we do have an application process for that, so that's kind of an intent to run. Uh, that typically will, typically will be due in May, and then in June we'll have a pre-lab. It's kind of, kind of an orientation of what you can expect when we go to our, our leadership lab camp at the end of June. And so while we're there, the kids get to campaign, and so they come up with slogans. This year, um, Danae ran for an office, and her slogan was, Don't Delay, Vote Danae. <laughs> and it was all about donuts. And so uh, we, th we worked with her. The th everything was themed towards donuts. So do not, de do not delay, vote Danae. 
Um, when they get to when they get to lab, they'll be able to have a poster and they'll kind of put, you know, if they have a theme, they'll theme it with donuts and they'll have, you know, kind of taking tidbits from their record book and, and showing what they have done and who they are. It's kind of our officer meet and greet. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have an interview process where they'll be interviewed by some um, some judges, typically county agents. We'll have an impromptu session and this is we want to see how well they can think on their feet so they'll be they'll answer questions that are a little typically off the wall and see how they answer those um interview application and then we have a a vote a popular vote and so all these go into a system um each and michelle could probably speak a little bit more on the point system she she manages the point system but there's a point system to determine who our delegates are or mm -hmm. excuse me our officers are going to be that system is a weighted system, and I don't have off the top of my head what percentage each, se each section is, but the interview, the application, and the pop popular vote are weighted differently, um, and then there's a formula that comes out with a number, and that's how we rank those after each individual vote. And I think one of the important things there, one of the take home messages to that is it's not just a popularity vote. It's not just, you know, the most likable kid in the, in the group. It's the kids that have also had productive 4-H careers. They've done a lot of things in 4-H and they, um, it's, it's, it helps make it more well-rounded as opposed to just, oh, we like Justin the best or Michelle's our favorite. We don't want, so. Yeah, and with those with those officer positions, just as we alluded to with our county and our county council, these district officers are going to meet once a month, and they're going to plan events for the district, such as community service projects that they're going to be doing uh, throughout the year. They're going to plan out their their meetings. We'll have two district meetings, typically in September, and then one in January, and so they're going to have that ability to plan on a even larger um, scale. Right, and you mentioned Leadership Lab, which is like a camp. And you know what? We haven't even we haven't even talked about the camps, camps and those kinds of things. <laughs> we could do a whole other other show, a whole other show with but, all of those kinds of opportunities. Most definitely. But we do have one more um, segment in this show that we're going to talk a little bit more about community service, and then we're going to wrap it up with top five because I like putting you guys on the spot to make you do the top five for wait for other things in 4-H. So the other things that you can do in 4-H, we'll talk about that um, in just a minute when we come back. But this is the Extension Hour with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, where we highlight our people, our programs, our partnerships. Obviously, 4-H is a big program that we have that uh, we're very proud of because of the wonderful things that it does. And um, we just want to help people learn more about 4-H, and that's what this series of shows is about. All right, I'm going to stop talking. We're going to come back, and we'll do one more segment um, in this show. And... We'll be back soon. Okay, bye. From the beginning, the main purpose of the Cooperative Extension Service has been to change human behavior by teaching people how to apply the results of scientific research. By utilizing a holistic, multi-level approach, Extension Family and Community Health Programs encourage health and well-being for everyone. Addressing values, concerns, and needs with reliable science-based information, Extension programs help people lead healthier lives. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. A Lone Star Community Radio is looking for those who are interested in hosting their own talk show with monthly and weekly slots available on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and on IRLoneStar.com. Start your own podcast, create your first YouTube channel, and be on TV. Contact Lone Star Community Radio online at IRLoneStar.com or call the station message line at 936-647-647. 3776 to take your first step into the radio world. Welcome back to the Extension Hour 4H 101, 4H Basics, and now we're talking more advanced 4H, and we still have even more to talk about. So we could do another one later that's, but wait, there's more and there's more. It's, it's like an infomercial, but not. 
4-H is more than that. Okay, <laughs> so we talked about um, leadership and how that leads to community service. We alluded a little bit in that first segment about um, community service, but one community service thing that we do is uh, One Day 4-H, and we've got some pretty impressive statistics for that. Do you want to share those, Justin? Yeah, so One Day 4-H, it is a statewide event that we have, and it's it's all geared towards community service, and we want to see what can we do in one day. And so all the club, 4-H clubs in Texas are encouraged to host a community service project for that day or that month. Um, and we, we have some pretty amazing stats, what Texas 4-H has done um, over the years. And so these are kind of averages of what, of, of the averages over the years of what we can expect for each year. So typically we're going to reach 47,000 folks with our community service projects, uh, whether it's going to be delivering, um, folks are going to be affected, impacted by our community service projects. They, we typically raise $15,000 in our projects, 7,000 pounds of food, um, 4,000 pounds of trash are collected and taken, usually taken off our sides of our roads. We're going to have about 3,000 youth and adults that are involved with 207, with 2,750, um, not man hours, but hours, kid hours that are going to be put in there, <laughs> um, with about 1,200 care packages all on one day. So that's uh, huge numbers that we give back to our Texas community just in one day from our Forge members. Yeah. And if it's not clear, that's one day that everybody's doing community service. Usually that's the second Saturday in October um, when that happens. So obviously we want kids to do, be doing uh, community service all year long, but that's just kind of a, a way to get everybody doing it uh, at the same time. And that's one of the ways to come up with those amazing numbers there. Um, so in addition to one day, we talked a little bit before about county council um, service projects, district service projects, state service projects. So there's kind of sponsored things that kids can participate. They can also participate on their own, just doing things to help people. And we've had kids come up with some really great um, ideas and just wonderful ways to reach the community. And I wish we had some more time to talk about it, but we're gonna we're gonna like bring this all to a close. Mm -hmm. All of these things that we've talked about in uh, 4-H and the opportunities that you can do. So we talked about signing up, getting involved, doing more, doing a project. So this um, show we've talked about doing a little bit more, but we want to know top five. Why should you join 4-H? Why should you do more in 4-H? What you guys got? <laughs> it's a great way to make friends and become a part of a whole nother community. We talked in our first show about this being a community of young people who are across the nation who are learning leadership, community service, and life skills. And it's a family. And if the more you interact and build relationships with your 4-H club, it becomes your 4-H family. Not only is 4-H fun, but it's a fun way to learn. And so in 4-H, we have, we like to put on uh, workshops. And so sometimes there'll be workshops geared towards your project and we might have a beef workshop, but sometimes we have a little off the wall workshop and it might be a murder mystery uh, workshop where it's, it's all about learning how to prepare nutritious meals in cooking. But that's through having the, di having, I know it kind of sounds funny, but. We probably need to explain that just a little bit. Our so it's, it's, it's a food and nutrition workshop yeah. where we actually okay. cook Twist. meals. And so during the lunch, we have a murder mystery. Okay. Or it, was, it wasn't a murder, it was a yeah, thief. Yeah, no, 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 no murder. With no murder. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a fun way to learn. It's, it, it makes is. it more engaging. And we'll have cake decorating uh, workshops. We'll do a meat science where we actually uh, learn how to select the proper steak from the uh, meat section. And then we'll actually go and grill steaks on actual grills and have okay. them for lunch. So fun workshops. That's another, what you got for number three? Try new things. There, There is not, there are not, many other opportunities that I can think of and I did Boys and Girls Club, I did Girl Scouts for a while, I was in FFA with the 4-H program the breadth, the broadness of the opportunities and the depth that you can take those opportunities um, you have lots and lots of choices so you have an opportunity to try lots of new things um, and it gives you give it gave me a chance to kind of investigate what other careers and and 
things that might be out there to be interested in, you know, as a grown-up. Um, so trying new things would be one of the biggest things. Grow, expand your comfort zone. All right, 10 years sounds like a long time to have a 4-H career. Like, if you've done 4-H one year, you've done 4-H, right? Maybe, but there's a lot more that could be done, so that's part of that trying new things. And just <laughs> from this little segment, it's a very steep learning curve, mm. um, and it takes a year or two to figure out what's out there before you can start really diving into what you really like doing. All right, number four, what you got, Justin? Also, as Amy mentioned, summer camp. Well, not just summer, but 4-H camps. We're pretty well known for our camps. We have county camps. We've done a robotic camp in the summertime. We'll have our district. We'll have a junior leadership lab for our intermediate kids, 6th through 8th grade. We'll have our leadership lab, which is going to be for our 9th through 12th graders during the summertime. And we have state camps at, our, at the Fort Center in Brownwood, Texas. And we'll have STEM camp, fishing camp, shooting sports camps, and then just summer camp in general where you just get to hang out with uh, all your friends, that you, all your new friends that you're going to make. And there's a uh, like the the one for quail, the Bob White Brigade. Brigades. And there's, there's a whole series. <laughs> yeah. I think there's seven different brigades. Um, if you have an interest in white-tailed deer, you can go and spend three days and not very much sleep learning about white-tailed deer, um, what they eat, where they go. The quail brigade, they um, actually release quail and then track them. Um, to try to find out, you know, how well they made it or what happened to them. Um, they spend a lot of time learning about it. And then they also are learning public speaking and organizational skills to be able to come back and present that information to the community in general when they come back. And the ambassador programs, those are not like camps, but that, that's another. <laughs> that's another thing we can talk about. <laughs> well, what do we have for number five? Or number one, would this be number one? Like, why? why I think we went backwards. This time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're all important. Maybe not. They're all good. They're all important. Yeah. They're all important. But yeah, I guess the 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 last thing I would say is like, if you just want to make the best better, whether it be yourself, your club, your community, or your country, or your world, you know, it's you're gonna make something better by joining 4-H, making, yeah, making the best better. Which is also conveniently the 4-H the motto. The 4-H motto. Yep. And then that is something that they. Um, we, we talked about saying the 4-H pledge and the motto, and that's something that they recite at each one of the meetings and the camps and the workshops and all kinds of things. So that uh, message gets reinforced. All right. There was lots, lots to go over, lots to talk about, There's and there's probably still <laughs> even more. But thank you guys for being here. Michelle Mahalik is our county extension agent, 4-H youth development in Montgomery County, and then Justin Sines is our 4-H, our County Extension Agent Urban Youth Development here in Montgomery County. Texas. Uh, Texas, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you're listening from somewhere else, yeah, of course, every county has awesome agents. Every county has a 4-H program. Um, every state in the United States has a 4-H program. 4-H is at one point, and probably still is really close, like one of the, the largest youth organizations um, in the nation or in the, in the world. Lots, lots to learn, lots to talk about. And, and yes, there's more. 30, <laughs> 32 countries in the world have something similar to the 4 H program. So you're joining a very large family. But definitely give us a call, look us up online, um, just to find out more because there is, there, even even everything we've talked about now, there's probably, there, there, not just probably, the there's more. Just the tip of the iceberg. iceberg. Yep. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. We'll do future programs about 4-H um, because there's more to talk about. But that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Extension Hour People Programs Partnerships here on Lone Star Radio. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.